glad that you're able to join us here. This uh, group uh, has gotten pretty big, a little bigger than I was anticipating for this, but uh, glad you could join us. Uh, I think this is mainly a, a test today to see if that saying, uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, it really it still applies or not. This is my first one of these webcast conferences, and we'll, we'll decide by the end of that day whether this is uh, a true statement or not. But I'm glad you could join us for today. Um, my intent is to uh, share today uh, the, the new ASAE standard and uh, some of the potential applications of it and some of the nutrient planning processes that we are all involved in. Uh, maybe just a, a couple of things for today, uh, more housekeeping things. Um, I assume that we've got everybody on uh, WebEx ready, which assumption? I, I have not had any more phone calls, so um, people are still adding in, and uh, so I would, let me see, we are up to um, 22 now, so we have a few more to go. All right. Uh, Betty, uh, in the spreadsheet I'm going to be using today, uh, I set my screen up to be a um, 1024 by 768 resolution, and as I understand it, it would work best if others were set up at that same resolution, um, so it, it, that would be correct, right? Um, well, this oh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> you may look at something about spreadsheets. If you're set up at a lower resolution, 800 by 600, you may have trouble seeing what's on the spreadsheet. I assume that while they're watching, they can go to their uh, their uh, start menu and, and reset their um, reset things if they, they wanted to. And in order to do that, they would hit their return key and then go to start and settings, control panel. And then under control panel, you should have a, a display option. And it's the settings that you would need to set to 1024 by 768. So if you're set at that or a higher level, I think you should be able to see everything. Uh, just a, a word, sometime today you may want to get to that point. Okay, one other housekeeping thing. Um, I sent out um, late yesterday a series of three handouts. If uh, you do not have those handouts, I think we can get by without them. But if you did not get those, uh, drop me an email and I'll make sure that uh, those are sent to you afterwards. Okay? And. Um, I guess, Betty, that, as was mentioned earlier, if you want to unmute and ask a question at any point, hit star six, and that will unmute your line. And then when you're done with your question, you can remute with the star six. So that was the housekeeping things I wanted to share. Um, back to the presentation for today. Uh, about three or four years ago, I guess it's about four years ago, 2002, uh, there was a group of animal scientists and ag engineers uh, from around the country that assembled and began discussing some of the problems we were having with the uh, current uh, ASA standard and some of the other standards that we had been using for some of our nutrient planning processes. And uh, it, it was obvious to us through a number of examples that were presented that these standards were, were badly out of date, did not represent many of the species that we're working with today of manure excretion, and that they needed to be updated. Also, we recognized that there was a, a real need at that point to have a, a standard that would kind of be self-updating, would change as animal characteristics, as animal performance, as animal diets changed. And so that became the impetus to, to start the revision of this. At that time, also, we were learning about you know this five or six six areas of a CNMP, recognizing that feed management was playing a could play a critical role in the nutrient planning process, and we wanted a, a standard that would be flexible enough to reflect changes in diet and give a producer either a credit for those changes or a, a deduction if they are changing their diet to a situation that would uh, cause excretion of more nutrients. So that was kind of the beginnings of that standard. The standard was released approximately a year ago. Uh, it's also 
being picked up by NRCS. They have completed the revision of the Chapter 4 in the Ag Waste Management Field Handbook. Uh, it's uh, in through the, gone through the peer review process. It's now going through kind of a, a technical editing and layout process. And in talking with some of the DC folks, it sounds like that Chapter 4 will be released with the, the new ASAE uh, values in it, in it uh, starting this fall of this year. So the, the standard that we'll be looking at today will become the same standard that's uh, used by NRCS. OK, let's uh, get started. And see, I need to click that and here. OK. We've got three objectives for today. Uh, first, I want to just review a little bit of the contents of the standard. We're going to also introduce some tools that are for estimating excretion, two tools in particular. And then final, finally, I'd like to share a few of my thoughts on some of the potential applications of this and some of the planning process that we're involved in. Uh, let's start with objective one, uh, looking at the ASAE standard and its contents. Uh, this is a, a graphic uh, of the previous standard. I imagine it's not real clear on your screen. But uh, this standard had some challenges in the fact that it was only allowed flexibility in terms of recognition of different animal species and, and body weight. And to us, it was obvious that uh, certainly we needed to know animal species, but body weight provided a, a very poor biological basis for explaining the variation in nutrient excretion that we see among animals. And so the biological basis for body weight being a, a critical parameter was, was very weak, one of the reasons why this standard needed to be updated. Uh, I think I skipped a slide here. Let me, I guess not. OK. Uh, the new ASAE standard is going to have a, uh, is based upon inputs that are dietary based and animal performance based. It provides a set of equations for estimating excretion. But in the end, I imagine most of us will never use those equations. We'll be using software or other tools for estimating the excretion that are based upon those equations. It also provides a, a tool uh, that can do both regional planning, as well as, as farm-specific estimates of excretion. And that was one of the real needs that this group originally expressed when they, we were assembling this, is that we needed a tool that could, be, could provide farm-specific values. Uh, I've shared with you uh, some resources. If you are wanting a copy of the standard, uh, that's the top uh, uh, top address, um, and I I know a couple, or one, at least one person that had trouble downloading that standard from that site. I think it's supposed to be available for free if you download the PDF, although I'm not sure I have my information correctly. Uh, one of the handouts I shared with you today has the first five pages of the standard, which is probably all that you'll you'll ever use. So that may be sufficient for most of us. Uh, the software we're going to be looking at comes from the University of Nebraska CNMP website, and uh, it's also a, a product that's available for free. OK. Let's uh, spend a little time talking about the standard and, and what's contained in it. The standard actually has eight different sections to it. The first section focuses on kind of the recommended typical excretion values. And this will be very similar to what you have used in the past. It's just a, kind of an updated table uh, of values that uh, represent maybe an average or a typical value for, for animals. And I would say those typical values are representative about the year 2002-2003. Now, even in that short time frame since then, there's been changes in the industry that would say some of those values are beginning to get a little bit dated. And in one example, would be in 2002, it was not typical to use something like phytase in the diets of, of, of swine. And since that time, the economics have become such that it's hard to find uh, feeding programs that do not include phytase. So already, the phosphorus excretion values for swine uh, have been reduced in cases. So 
this standard, even this typical values table, will become dated with time, and that's just one example already. You should be looking at a table of the typical values, and if you have your standard printed out, this we're looking at tables 1A and 1B, and I've kind of grouped them together on this one page, and they're they're on located on page one and two in the standard. Uh, thought I would uh, just point out a couple of things about this table of, of values. Many of these things look similar to what you've used in the past. Part A is used for the meat animals, uh, beef cattle, uh, finished swine, uh, your poultry, your, your meat birds in the poultry sector would be examples. And the units are on a per finished animal basis. So it's pounds of nitrogen per finished animal, liters of manure per finished animal. So instead of asking how many animals and how many days they are in this facility and what their weight is, which would we what we would have done in the past, we're going to need to ask over the time frame that you are making a measurement, maybe it's a one year period, how many animals did you finish in this operation? Uh, the second part is for uh, really any other animals, it, it, mostly animals that uh, are in the reproductive parts of the herd, or, or the, the dairy herd is a good example of that. And on those, for those animals, the standard report is on a unit per day per animal. So you'll need to know both the number of animals that are the, the number of animals in the facility as well as, as the number of days that facility is occupied by those group of animals to make your calculations. So a little bit of change uh, in terms of units that are used from previous standards. A couple other things I wanted to point out in this standard uh, while we're still here. Uh, first, you will notice that some values are bold, some are not. Any of the values that are bold are based upon species specific equations that were generated as part of this process. Values such as, let's say, volatile solids for uh, a poultry broiler is not bolded. Uh, those values were not based upon a species specific equation that was developed. So recognize that, that difference between the bold and the unbold. Okay. Now, some of these values actually start with one of the bolded values. And in the example of the volatile solids from the broiler, that starts with a calculation of total solids. So that uses that species specific equation. And it multiplies that times an assumed value of a relationship between volatile solids and total solids. And so there is one part of that calculation that was not based upon the new standard, was based upon historical data. And so that's why that's not bolded. So recognize some of the differences that exist between the bold and the unbold values. Okay. Uh, we're now, uh, let's see here. A couple other things i just share with you. Uh, the calculation of total manure volumes or mass, uh, those are not bolded. So they aren't strictly an equation-based approach. Uh, they started from an estimate of total solids, which is based upon equations that were generated. We then divided that total solids by the assumed moisture content, which was an assumption we've had to pull from the literature or past values. And so in part, the estimate of total manure excretion is based upon these equations, but in part based upon an assumption of, of moisture content. So again, you see that those are not bolded as a result. Okay. Now just to do a, a quick comparison of some of the old versus the new values. Uh, you see the nitrogen value for, uh, let's say, the beef feeder as an example for the new values versus the old versus the Ag Waste Management Field Handbook Chapter 4 value. And if you look down through those nitrogen values, not large changes except for in the area of dairy. Uh, with the dramatic increases we've seen in dairy production levels and the feeding programs that have had to change dramatically to respond to these higher levels of milk production, you would expect a much higher excretion of nitrogen 
because of that. But many of the other species saw very little changes on the nitrogen value. On the phosphorus side, this where a number of the values are quite different. And you can see in the case of the beef feeder, we're looking at values that are roughly half of what the, the old values were. Now, this value of 7.3 uh, pounds per finished animal, that probably is a very good value for an animal being fed down in Texas, where they're basing their diets primarily on, on a corn-based diet. It's probably not as an accurate uh, value for up here in, in Nebraska, where we've probably got some distillers' byproducts going into that. And we'll get into that later. So even these values, we re have to recognize there is a range around those values. Okay, And you can see some of the other changes. A lot of times, the phosphorus values declined. One exception, again, was the, the dairy. Okay. Now, that's section one. Uh, the thing I want you to recognize is these values probably have their greatest in per or their best use is when we're doing regional planning. When we are doing individual farm planning, we've got to recognize there's a pretty significant range around those values. And they may not be representative of an individual farm. So I like to tell people is that when you want the, an accurate answer, using these table values is quite suspect. Or you have to recognize there's a potential for a large error around those values. OK, I'm going to move on to the second, actually the second through the seventh section. Sections two through seven are species-specific sections that provide equations and at a minimum, there are equations in each of those sections for estimating dry matter, excretion, nitrogen, and phosphorus excretion. Okay. Um, we have them for this, these five species. I think that's all I wanted to share there. Uh, two different approaches were used uh, with poultry, beef, and swine. The authors chose to use a mass balance approach in estimating excretion with the retention values generally coming from the National Research Council from a series of species-specific publications they produce uh, where they use retention values for estimating uh, feeding programs. So that's the approach used with those three species, horse and dairy use Regression equations, they had large or significant databases that regression analysis. And uh, you can see that they even use that, those regression approaches for uh, estimating parameters beyond dry matter nitrogen. Okay. Now if we want to take a look at kind of a range you might see around some of these values, I'll show an example for a, a beef feeder. Um, you can see the typical values are listed there, 55 pounds of nitrogen per animal, per finished animal. But with just a typical range in performance and feeds that's available, we would expect that that value would range anywhere from 46 to 64 pounds. Now, that's less than 20% plus or minus on that nitrogen side. But if you look at it on the phosphorus side, now we're dealing with some, a value that we might expect to be as much as 40% below that or as much as 90% above. So you can see the challenge in using a, a, a typical value, uh, especially when we're doing some site-specific planning for far, individual farms. OK. Now, I prefer to see the equations being used when we are doing that site-specific planning. It means the collection of a little bit more data from that farmer. But I think we can do a much better, more accurate estimate of the volumes of manure that we're dealing with, as well as the mass of manure, of manure nutrients that we need to, to manage for. I think this, these equations also might have value if you want to develop a set of typical excretion estimates that are specific to your state or to a, a, a certain circumstance that you encounter in your state. So we would not always have to go back to a set of typical national values, but you could, based upon the ASAE standard, move to a set of typical state values. 
instead. So that might be another approach. The other thing, place that I think we really need to look at this is if we are going to be curious about using nutritional strategies and giving producers credit for those strategies, uh, then we ought to be using this approach uh, to ensure that that credit is given. Any of our previous standards have not allowed us to do this, and certainly you'll see the, the opportunity to do this here in just a second. Okay, I think that's where I'm going to take a, a break and ask if there's two or three quick questions that uh, people would like to ask. Um, and you would you could uh, do that by hitting pound or I star six and uh, just asking your question over the phone line. Any questions at this point? Sir, there's a question over in the uh, Q and A. Did you see that one? Okay, and I find Q and A. You can go back to a split screen. You can return to your split screen. Okay. I see. Hi, Rick. <laughs> and okay. I it should be right under. Why did mine go back? Okay, here we go. Um, it's from Carl. Okay. Is it linear relationship if the finish time is different than the table value? Uh, we are going. It, let's. In case of finishing our animals that we finish for meat production, the relationship will be based. Part of that relationship will be based on the number of days, but really what we're after is the pounds of feed per day average over that cycle. So if you can get a good average over that cycle period of pounds of feed intake per day, that will that will adjust for different finish length periods. Now, I assume that maybe he's asking that relative to some of the typical table values. I hope that's right, Carl. Uh, in that case, yeah, I guess we would have to assume it's linear, that if we set up a 153-day period on the beef, you, you finish that animal in 120 days. Uh, about the only thing you could do is make that assumption if you're going to use the typical values. Uh, the preference would be to go to the site-specific values and, and use the equations. Any other questions? Did I put them all to sleep, Betty? <laughs> Are they still there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Remember pound oh. or star six? I said pound. Star six will uh, unmute your phones. I wish I had one of these star six buttons for my kids. It would be nice. <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, Let's see, why was the regression used in one case and a mass balance used in others? Russell person, okay. Uh, Russell, when we put the standard together, we set up species-specific groups. And so there was a dairy group, there was a horse group, there was a swine group, and so forth. Each of those groups were pretty much independently, and they each made their own decision as to which approach to use, and that was their decision. Uh, I think there's kind of an ongoing debate uh, amongst ourselves as to whether the regression approach versus the mass balance approach is better, but at this point, it was strictly a, uh, a group of experts for each individual species that made that choice. Okay. Well, Betty, I think I'm going to move on, and what I'd like to do is to use four more slides, three more slides, and then I'm going to go to the spreadsheet. So, okay. okay. If uh, okay, I got this back up. There is a hand calculator for that can be used for making species-specific uh, estimates of excretion if you don't want to use the software. And this actually appeared before the, the standard was released in MWPS 18, uh, Section 1 on manure characteristics. And you can see a, a website as to how to get a hold of that uh, if you want to order a copy. I think most of you should have a copy of that if you're doing any nutrient management planning. It's on the, the next to the last page of the publication. 
and you can see kind of a quick overview of that publication here. I have a, we're going to run short on time, so the example I'm going to share with you is going to be very short, and I'm going to skip through it pretty quickly. I'd set up an example of a dairy herd and the information we need to collect from that dairy herd in order to use that hand calculator. I'm not going to say much more and just give you a quick glimpse of it. We're looking at the top of the worksheet, and there you would need to enter feed nutrient intake. And uh, you can see the calculation. You would need to put in the feed intake, the nutrient concentration, and from that you calculate the pounds of nitrogen phosphorus in the dietary intake each day. Next, we need to look at nutrients retained. And you fill in the section, these dairy cows are on the milk. They were producing 11,875 pounds of milk for all 175 cows. We can, knowing a typical concentration of nutrients in the milk, we can estimate what was retained in the milk products. And the last step is simply to estimate what's excreted. And that's simply a difference between what was the intake, what was excreted, and in this case, times 365 days. And so that gives us the value of nitrogen and phosphorus excretion. So that is one tool that you have that you're, you're certainly welcome to use. It's, a, it's not based exactly on these equations, but in checking it against the equations, I'd say it's very reasonable. Uh, it's a, a very good approach to use. Okay. Now, now I'm going to take you through a separate example, and let me just lay out some of the conditions here that we'll be looking at today. And we're going to do this on a, a spreadsheet problem. We're going to be using a beef cattle example, a couple of different diets, and a couple of different uh, feed digestibilities that time allows today. So Betty, I now need to uh, share my desktop. All right, go back up to share. Okay, desktop. All right, is up. Now, I, I, if you have different screen settings uh, in terms of the resolution of your screen, this is where things may look a little different or not quite correct. Since this spreadsheet was originally developed on a pretty high resolution screen, when I downsized it to this uh, 1000 by 768, sometimes you'll see things that didn't quite fit right. And uh, not sh I think for the most part, it looks pretty good on my screen, but it may not look real good on yours. So when you get this spreadsheet, you may have to do some playing with the resolution settings that you want to use for this. And if things don't all fit on the screen, the yellow area doesn't all fit on the screen, you may need to do some things like changing the, uh, the size of the, uh, the, I guess, the, the, how far you're going to uh, zoom in on it or so forth. I found that uh, on a thousand by 768, if I set that zoom to 80%, it seems to fit pretty well. Okay, this is our manure nutrient and land requirement estimator. The manure nutrient component is based upon the new ASA BE standard. The land, the land component is based upon procedures that are in Chapter 11 of the NRCS Ag Waste Management Field Handbook. So that will be the basis for the little the problem we're going to work through today. And what I'm trying to get you to is to be able to put in a value for feed intake or nutrient concentration in the feed and ask the question, how does that impact the land base that I need access to? Uh, about third or a little bit down on the screen, you can see a series of six steps that are laid out. And as we complete each of these steps, you will see information begin to appear in blue. Some of that's already begun to appear because I've hit pre-entered most of the data. But as you finish a step, you'll see this blue information begin to show up, and that would give you an indication I've possibly completed that step. And the gray buttons with the red print on are designed to facilitate movement, facilitate printing, 
uh, things such as clearing the worksheets so, and so forth. And so we'll, you'll see those used pretty extensively. So we're going to get started here with this example beef cattle farm. And try, it's a head feedlot, turns cattle twice a year, and I would like to know what land base they need access to. So our first step is to go to a place called Getting Started. This is a place where you would need to enter some background information about the producer, about the consultant possibly, and then about the manure sources. The first column, uh, CE, you would simply type in a name that the producer would commonly use to describe different facilities, different sources of manure. And then in the column next to that, you would pick from a list of items here the manure source that are the the uh, description of that manure handling system that best matches that facility. So for this beef cattle feedlot, we're going to have an open lot with scraped and stockpiled solids. And I've already made a selection for the swine finisher that's on this farm. Now, as soon as you select an open lot, the question will pop up over here, is runoff collected? And you can indicate yes or no simply by clicking on that button there. Once we've done that, uh, we're ready for, we're finished with that. We'll click on return, and that will take us back to our starting point or to this menu of steps. Okay. Step two. Uh, we need to enter farm-specific information to estimate excretion. And I'm going to do it for beef. Um, there are a number of steps here. You can start by describing the facility or the conditions you're evaluating, whatever information you want. We'll next enter some information on performance for step 2B. We'll describe whether we're dealing with English or metric units. Uh, step 2C, we enter information about the feed program, including whether we're going to do things on a wet or a dry basis. Step 2D, we'll enter a little bit of information on the uh, manure management system. Okay. Now, I'm going to start by using a, this default button. Each of the species has a default button that puts in the assumed parameters that were used to give you the typical values that we talked about at the beginning of the day. So if I click on that, it enters a data for this typical animal, uh, and then we will have to update that. Now, I'm going to assume that many of these typical values are good for today for this particular animal, for this particular feedlot, although the number of cattle uh, we're going to have to change to 2,500 head capacity and uh, finishing capacity in one year of 5,000 head. So that's all. Everything else is fine for today. Our feeding program has been laid out. We're consuming about 20 pounds of feed per animal per day on a dry matter basis. You can see some of the characteristics of that feed. Uh, there's the, dry, the protein content and the phosphorus content. This would be a diet like we'd feed probably down in Texas or animals that do not have access to the distiller's byproducts. We need to also fill in this inner manure management system. And as we saw on that getting started page, we could put in up to four different facilities from which manure are collected. And the ones you put in at that point are identified. And we're going to identify that this manure is going to be collected from our beef cattle feedlot. Assume the value that was entered for total solids was a excreted total solids. Oh, didn't mean to do that. And uh, I'm going to uh, revise that to something that's more in the line with maybe what's harvested from that feedlot. So we're going to assume that that drives down to about 60% of that feedlot. You could enter an ash content. We've tried in our estimates from the beef cattle section to estimate to provide a reasonable estimate of what is actually going to be harvested. And one of the two big changes that occur in feedlots is the amount of drying that occurs, as well as the amount of soil that gets entered mixed in with the manure. Uh, 
it's uh, going to make an assumption of a 50% ash content. And if you don't like that value, you could enter a, a different value. If you get in the manure analysis, many of the manure analysis I see anymore will have that ash content posted on that manure analysis. And we need to also identify, are we dealing with a solid manure or a liquid and slurry? And we're dealing with a solid manure today. So I've entered the data. Everything is all set up. I have the capability of doing this for three different groups of cattle. I've actually entered a second group prior to this, and uh, I'm going to make a little bit of a comparison with that in just a second. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and get things set up. You'll notice with the second group of cattle, everything's the same except for the diet is higher, nitrogen and phosphorus. This is about a 40% inclusion rate of distillers byproducts. I've changed the ash content. Uh, and we'll just take a look at that also. Everything else is the same. So once we have got step A, 2A, 2B, 2C, and 2D, we're ready to move on. Final step is to hit my return key. That takes us back to the beginning here. You can see the animals that we have entered at this point. And my next step would be to look at what's been explained what is being excreted. So I'm going to look at, click on the beef manure button. It will take me to the results of those calculations. The left-hand side of this page, you'll see everything laid out in terms of metric units, and on the right side, English units. And so I'll be looking at the English units here today. Uh, you can see feeder group one and two. And you can see the difference in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus excretion. The other thing that I would is expect will vary would be the manure mass that we're dealing with. So we're going to deal with 10,000, 10 million pounds of manure. If it's if it's at that 50% uh, ash content, if we've got more soil that's been mixed in, we're dealing with 17,000 or 17 million pounds. So you can see that if I was to compare nutrients to tons of manure, that I would expect a totally different manure sample in terms of concentration for these animals in group one versus group two. And if we could do a decent job of it, or at least with phosphorus, we probably can do a pretty decent job of estimating the the manure, what the manure sample should look like. We just divided phosphorus, maybe converted to P2O5 divided by the tons of manure here. So that's the data that we have that was calculated for that beef herd. Now, we can also move back to where we entered those results. There's buttons for the data, moving back to the data inputs down the middle. I dropped this second group out. I'm just going to put it at zero. So the only group of cattle we're going to be concerned about is this cattle group number one. Okay. Anybody have any questions at this point? It's star six. Yes, Rick. Go ahead. Uh, oh, the thing started talking to me. I got confused. This is Carl. Uh, going back to the uh, the timeline on the days there, the 153. Is that a calculated? Uh, is that a calculated figure so that if you change that, that will uh, come out in the calculations as the total poundage? Yes, Carl. Uh, all of the aqua-colored cells are where you enter your farm-specific information. Now, that 153 is an assumed value for that typical animal. If I wanted to, let's say I was feeding these out a lot faster, maybe it's 140 days, I could enter that data and it would change the excretion. Uh, let's, I'm not sure I remembered what the old values were to say if things, how much they changed, but the nitrogen phosphorus excretion should have changed. In reality, what we did was we fed those animals grew a lot quicker, so they were re their feed intake was a lot lower over the total length of period, and they still gained the same weight and the okay. assumptions we use. So okay. I would expect our nitrogen and phosphorus excretion to be substantially lower. And on page two that you're on right now, the, the N and P are those total pounds? 
Those are total in an elemental form. Okay. All right. Thank you. For that group of animals. Any other questions, Eric? Not for me. Okay. I'm going to jump back to this. Well, I should have uh, corrected that change we made. And let's just return. And at this point, we've entered our beef animals. I'd also like to enter that group of swine that's on this farm, just to let you see a little different page. Pages have many similarities in their appearance. Uh, I'm going to go down here to where it says Grow Finish. We've divided these out by different types of production, or phases of production. And I'm going to use the default value today entered all of that. I need to assign the source of the manure. And then everything else I'm going to keep the same. Here might be an interesting place uh, to take a look at how the amount of water that gets added to the manure might change the volumes that we're dealing with. If I keep this at 10% total solid, and I view my results here, and it looks like we need to move over just a bit. Here's the cubic feet of manure produced by that 1,000 pigs per year, 54,000. If I go back, and let's say I'm working on it with a shallow pit, and I'm using a fair amount of fresh water in, uh, in uh, refilling those shallow pits after the plug has been pulled, and maybe I've got waterers that are not very conservative in terms of their water use. Uh, it's probably very possible to see uh, values for total solids in that 4% range. So now if I go back and look at my results, the, that difference should be reflected in the manure. So by knowing total solids, which is estimated by the equations in combination with what that style of production will produce in terms of the moisture content of the manure, we can make a much better estimate of manure volumes. We can size storages that are farm specific rather than storages that use the same value for a pig in North Carolina or a pig in Iowa or, or, or wherever. So I think uh, they make us force us to rethink a little bit in terms of things such as, as sizing activities that we do. So everything, I think, oh, I wanted to, uh, I think I said this was going to be a 2,000 head finishing floor. So we'll go ahead and make that one change. But now if I return and identify the animals that I have access to in that middle group of feeder cattle, remember there's none, no animals being finished there, so that's really just going to drop out as, as a zero. Here's my excreted manure for these two groups of animals. And my next step is to estimate the crop available nitrogen and phosphorus. So let's do that. This is beginning to use procedures in the NRCS uh, Chapter 11 Ag Waste Management Field Handbook. You can see the amount of manure excreted. We look up a value based upon the type of storage system we selected earlier, and it tells us that 50% of the nitrogen will be retained. If you don't like that, you could put your own value in directly below, and it would update this amount retained based upon your value. We then need to select the how we're going to land apply it. If you're thing other than broadcast, it will estimate an organic nitrogen and an ammonia nitrogen availability. If you're surface broadcasting, you also need to enter days. And for a Nebraska condition, we might put the manure on in December, let's say, and it might not get moved into the soil until 90 days later, until the spring tillage. We also need to identify soil conditions. And based upon that, we now have an organic and an ammonium nitrogen uh, estimates available. And after all of these losses or retention values are considered, it then estimates what is crop available in that last 
section. Now, table one was for nitrogen. Table two is for phosphorus. And down below, there is even a, a table three that tries to make an estimate of phosphorus retained in an anaerobic lagoon down in the, in the sludge. The accuracy of that is always one that uh, is worth questioning, but it, the estimate is there if you want it. Okay. So using these procedures, pretty much the same in the phosphorus table, we now know that we have 94,000 pounds of nitrogen we need to find a home for from the manure. And there's a separate value been calculated for the runoff collection pond. And down below, we've done the same on the phosphorus. Again, we're still dealing with elemental nutrients. Okay. So I'm ready to return. We have after losses, the crop available nutrients. Now I need my land base. And we're going to do it only for the manure solids. And this table allows us to do that. Here is where we would enter fields, characteristics of those fields, and some production or yield to those fields. So let's say I type in that that's a, a north pivot, 130 acres. We're going to go corn on it, yield to 208. And it will make an estimate of nitrogen removal plus an efficiency factor, which is, in the case of uh, corn, is about 30% of the nitrogen removal has been used. And so that, based upon that estimate, it, we're estimating that that crop will use about 203 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Now, if you have a different procedure that you would prefer to use for estimating nitrogen removal, since you don't have a soil test at this point, you can put in your own value, and uh, it will use your value over the book value. So this first field will use up 22,000 pounds out of the 94,000. We have 71,000 left over, and it kind of goes through this checkbook balance until you get to zero. This place, this place, we also have the same thing going on for phosphorus. And you can see I had to add a, a, an extra field. I just called it my neighbor's cropland. And I had to add a, another 1,300 acres to get this to go to zero. Now, I don't think we have the time. Uh, I would have liked to have gone back and put in different nutrient uh, intake values uh, in terms of the concentration of the nutrients in the feed and then recalculated those values. But I think you can get an idea of the process that goes on here. So we've pretty well completed that. Our last step is to review the summary. And we have a summary page that you could print out here that would take values from each of those tables we have looked at and provide you at the bottom the number of acres you needed to manage the nitrogen and the phosphorus, as well as the quantity of nutrients that we're dealing with at different places in the system. So that is the software that I wanted to share with you today. And let me take a breather here and see if there's any questions that we have. Do we have any questions that have been typed in, Betty? No, I don't see any. OK. Just scheduling this right after lunch. We've got them all snoozing by now, I'm sure. Uh, Carl here, Rick. OK. Well, go ahead. You're awake, Carl. Yeah, I'm awake. <laughs> this is my nap time now. OK. Uh, is there any uh, capability on that last page to uh, uh, to incorporate soil test phosphorus data and override that with a phosphorus uptake of the crop as opposed to just a total phosphorus need? Right, this value right here. Yes. Okay. Maybe you explain that, and I, I took my quick nap right there. Okay. Uh, if you wanted, to, if you had a high soil phosphorus level and you wanted to put in a zero there, you certainly could. Okay. Yeah. I of course, you'd never get the acres to balance out then. Right. Right. But you could put in your own values there. And that's what those blue columns are. We tried to put in overrides in any place that we thought it was appropriate. Okay. Got it. Thanks. 
we visualize this type of software being used generally when you don't have a slow test. This is kind of when you're doing what I call the strategic or long-term planning, where you might not have soil tests to work with. And so that's why we have based this on a removal rate, and in the case of not removal rate plus an efficiency factor. And there are some notes down here at the bottom that tell you those efficiency factors that were used for different crops, including legumes. Ray Perry has a question. Okay. I need to see here. Okay. Uh, what is the land runoff tab? Okay. Let's see, I need to get back to my spreadsheet. The land runoff tab does the exact same thing, but this is looking at the nutrients that are in that holding pond that we collected from the runoff from our feedlot. So you, we've kind of skimmed over this, but we assumed about 5% of the nutrients in the, that the animal excreted were actually going to run off, get into the holding pond, and then you can go through the same calculation to make sure you have sufficient land for uh, dealing with runoff. There's another page similar to this that does it for sludge. It only looks at it on a phosphorus basis. We didn't have any idea how to estimate the nitrogen in the sludge. But if you wanted to try to estimate what land base you'd need to manage the phosphorus in the sludge, uh, that's a possibility also. Any last questions? Yes, this is Les Everett, University of Minnesota. Uh, Purdue, uh, Brad Jorn has been charged by NRCS to develop the software nationwide uh, for manure management planning. Uh, for NRCS, do you know if either this software or the, the standards have been picked up in that software, or if there's some interaction that's going to be involved there? Yes, listen. Uh, I uh, met with Brad here about two weeks ago, and we've been interfacing for the last year or so. Uh, I'm going to actually go back to the PowerPoints and try to answer your question with with a PowerPoint that I have coming up ahead. Okay, Betty, I need to uh, get back. Upper right hand, upper right hand corner, click on the share and okay. in desktop, exit desktop. Upper right hand corner, there's a share, green share. Okay, there we go. All right. There we go. And I need to now go full screen. All right. So we're going to conclude with a little discussion on how we integrate this in. And let me answer your this last question with this graphic here. I tend to think of the planning process as being this five-step process with actually two stages of planning that go on. There's a kind of a strategic or long-term planning that we do when we maybe when we're building the facility, when we're getting a permit. There's also a maybe a more tactical or an annual planning process that we go through. And the, that annual planning process is really the purpose of Brad Jorn's software. How many tons or how many gallons of manure do you need to apply to each acre next year? Now, they try to forecast that out five years uh, in advance. And I have a lot of questions as to the value of doing that. Because when you do that, that tells the producer that says, you really don't need a soil test to do this work, and you don't need a, a manure analysis, because I can tell you what that value should be. Well, in reality, that Brad would recognize that you can't do that, and that those values need to be adjusted based upon the soil test and the manure analysis. So what Brad is doing is really this annual planning. What I'm doing is really more this strategic planning. How many acres do I need access to? And so I would suggest what we just looked at is more that strategic planning process. That is appropriate at one point in time. But when it gets down to that annual planning process, much of what we've gone through you probably won't use. You really need your farm-specific information, your soil tests, your manure analysis, your calibration rate for your equipment, and you'll be determining your application rate. So I hope that begins to answer your question. I really see what Brad is doing is a different planning step than what I am doing here in this more the strategic phase. 
Now, there's some other discussion we could have along this line, but I'm, I'm going to use up my time if I don't keep moving on here. Okay, value of the equations, uh, and let me just run through three or four applications I see of these equations. Uh, first, I think we do a much better job than has ever been done before of predicting manure solids. So where we have designs that are based upon manure solids, such as treatment systems, like anaerobic lagoons, aerobic processes, we can do a much better job of sizing anaerobic digesters, sizing anaerobic lagoons, estimating gas production from anaerobic digesters with these values than we ever could have previously uh, with our, our old typical values. And we can make them farm specific if we're willing to make that effort. So that's one application. I think the combination of solid prediction that we make and a working knowledge of a manure moisture content we would expect from facilities similar to the one that maybe we're going to build gives us a better prediction of manure volumes. I think we can better estimate manure size, manure storage size, do a better job of estimating application time, equipment requirements, cost, and things such as this. Okay. So that would be a, a second a, a way I would tend to use this. In fact, Ray Massey is using our spreadsheet and trying to answer that last question right now. Ray Massey is an ag economist down at the uh, University of Missouri. And so he is trying to answer land application timing, equipment, and cost, starting with our, our spreadsheet for estimating excretion. Uh, just to give you an example, um, saw a little bit of this earlier, but when we have different levels of water being added, and very common to see ranges 4 to 8, up to 10 percent, I think, in our storages from our swine barns, we need to have manure storage volumes that reflect that variation. Last. Uh, as I think we would all have expected, I think we can use this in better predicting nutrients for estimating total land requirements. I think there's even some possibility that we could do a reasonable job of predicting a manure sample, maybe even better than the manure sample itself. But that rem that's a guess on my part and, and not a proven issue. But if we can make a good job at estimating farm-specific nutrient excretion, and solid production, and combine that with a known moisture content of that manure, I think we can estimate a manure analysis that may even be better than what we can sample out of the storage. But that we'll have to, to learn that with time. Last thing, I it's kind of one of these uh, uh, soapboxes I get on. I, I really think we need to do a better job in providing producers performance measures as to how they're doing in terms of nutrients. We can use what we've just gone through today to, to tell the producer what's the pounds of phosphorus it took to produce a pound of meat that you put into the, into the meat case at the supermarket. So maybe this will allow us to begin doing some of those kinds of things. And just as an example here, I call it my hamburger index, uh, a corn-based ration, making some assumptions of a, for a farm. 33 pounds of phosphorus to produce a pound of meat. My distiller's based diet, 63 pounds. Maybe we begin using this in labeling certain products that are green products, as an example. I also show an example for differences in feed efficiency, which aren't quite as dramatic in the range. Okay. I think I'm down to my wrap-up messages for today. What we have provided you with through the new ASAE standards are two values, a typical value that I would suggest is best used for regional planning and an equation-based value for manure excretion that is based on that should be used on farm-specific planning, might even be used for some more state-specific standards uh, that uh, you might want to use. This New standards, I would suggest right now, is best used in some of our strategic or long-term planning processes. I don't think it's a substitute for software like what Brad Jorn is using uh, to, to estimate that annual manure application. 
Now, Brad and I have had uh, discussions on how we use some of these values to do some checks and balances of the numbers that are getting put into his planner, and, and you may see some of that being used in Brad's planner in, in that way. It also allows uh, an integration of animal diet into the planning process. And we're going to get serious about making animal diet one of the six components of a, a comprehensive nutrient management plan. This is the value that will put numbers, will, will give us acres of land that we need access to based upon diet, will give us cost of transportation based upon what we feed the animals, uh, will give us size of the manure storage based upon what we feed the animals. So this will be the kind of data or approach that we will need to use if we're trying to adapt these plans based upon what that producer is doing from a dietary standpoint. So that's uh, my end for the day. We got, we're about to reach the end of our time, but I'd be glad to take a few questions, I bet, if you yep. allow us there to do that. There is a question from Kurt. I'm going to go okay. back to your split screen. You'll see it. Okay. And I'm getting so I can do this here. Yeah. Okay. For our flush lagoon systems we use in the North Carolina, it isn't clear to me that a manure management system we should choose in the spreadsheet. There is, uh, in that first page, uh, the getting started page, where you select the manure storage systems, there are anaerobic lagoons, single cell and, and uh, multiple cell anaerobic lagoons in that list. They do not identify if this is a flush base or a pull plug base. So there would be some variation in terms of how much dilution would occur, but generally, that degree of dilution probably doesn't have a big impact on how we use it, and that we use those uh, those systems to identify what's the nitrogen retained in that storage system. So I think by going to either the multiple cell anaerobic lagoon or single cell anaerobic lagoon, Carl, that may solve that problem. All right. Any other thoughts today? Questions today. This is Vinicius from uh, Louisiana. Yes, Vinicius. Um, I have two questions for you here. Uh, how do you calculate the nutrient losses in the, the spreadsheet? And uh, the other question is, how do they account for the different manager, manure management practices? Okay. All right. Uh, making a note of this now. Uh, Betty, I had two or three, or I had four or five uh, questions we were going to try to put up as a survey. Do we want to let people be answering that while I answer these sure. questions? Sure, uh -huh. that'd be fine. Now, what do I need to do? Okay, go back to, yeah, all right, and do you have it, what, on your, um, in uh, Microsoft Word, or what do you have it in? Oh, I emailed them to you. Oh, we may not have them. Huh? No, we do not. Did I not see them? I'm sorry. Let me see if I can. You keep talking. I'll see if I can find them real quick and get them up. All right? And I could email them out to folks and let them respond if we don't find it. Okay. All right. I'll try to answer those questions. And I hope I that two minutes I didn't lose them. One was on manure losses. And, Manisha, it was specific to how did that get calculated? Right. Okay. There are three calculations uh, for what nitrogen, or primarily nitrogen, was retained by the system. The first is was based upon the manure storage system that you selected. So if you picked a below barn pit versus a single stage anaerobic lagoon, it would go to a table and pick out different values of nitrogen retention. And in the case of the anaerobic lagoon, there would be a different, there would be a value for phosphorus retention less than 100 percent. Those are in a lookup table. They are based upon values we pulled out of Chapter 4 or Chapter 11 of the Ag Waste Management Field Handbook. If you decide you would like to change those values to be more site specific, I can direct you to where you find those, and you can provide values for for Louisiana. The second place 
is a calculation of organic nitrogen availability and ammonium nitrogen availability. And those, again, uh, the organic nitrogen availability, those are numbers that we use here in Nebraska in terms of what we expect to be available over a four-year period for organic nitrogen availability. You may not like those values, and you, you may want to change those values in particular. Again, they're in a lookup table, and we can get you there. The ammonium nitrogen availability was an equation, and it came, again, from the Ag Waste Management Field Handbook. They have a table that had values for, I think, three or four different data points, and then we set an equation to those data points and, and, and use that to, to make that estimate. But if you see that you would like to modify any of those values or equations to be more specific to your own situation, be glad to help you uh, figure out how to do that. And it, it should not be hard. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Not you exhausted for the day. Is that it? You know, it's a, kind of a strange feeling being on this end and having nobody responding. So you can all hit that pound six and, and, and now if you want to. <laughs> uh, my guess is we may not get those my questions up here. Uh, I will send you a, an email uh, later today with, a, I think it's four or five questions that I would appreciate if you would respond to. Give me just a little bit of feedback as to how this went. Um, would like to know if it worked in terms of getting access uh, to WebEx and, and if how the spreadsheet looked, how the, the WebEx presentation looked, and things such as that, as well as just what you gained from the presentation. Other questions before we break up? Betty? I almost have the first one ready. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I oh, just did not see that in the my email. Okay. Um, is this going to take several minutes? You think? Yes, it will. So better, we maybe just better send them out separately and have them answer them back by email. Yeah. Okay, we'll do it that way. Okay. And would you send me an updated list, uh, email list? I will do that. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. And I guess we're done for the day. Um, All right.